It's Monday, it's 12.15 and we're live in Westminster. Joining me, Conservative MEP Dan Hannan, Independent MP Angela Smith, Editor of Spiked Online Brendan O'Neill, and Senior Editor at Navarra Media Ash Sarkar. Today, this. Uh, this morning, we have all now resigned from the Labour Party. Seven MPs quit Labour in protest at the party's handling of Brexit, anti-Semitism and Jeremy Corbyn's leadership. We'll talk to Angela Smith about why she's left. Good morning, how nice to see you all here this morning. Jeremy Corbyn says he's disappointed and his supporters say it will only help the Conservatives. We offer not only a new party, although it is that, but a new approach to politics. It's the biggest breakaway since 1981. What chance that these MPs will break the mould of politics? And we'll be talking to the American author, Robin DiAngelo, about why she says white people find it difficult to talk about race. Right, let's get a brief reaction from all of you about the news about the Labour MPs who've quit their party. It's a very brave thing to do, right? Nobody does something like this lightly or casually. Uh, you, mm. spend, you spend decades in a party, you have friendships there, it goes well beyond your politics. And wherever we stand on the political spectrum, I think we should recognise the basic courage and integrity of anyone in any party who makes a step like this. Ash? Well, I think that this has been something which has been a long time coming, particularly since the website for independent.group has been registered since 2015. I would ask why now is the moment to go, but I think it is your right to do so. If you don't agree with the direction of a party, of a membership of half a million people, then it's your right. Oh, it's such a lame split. I mean, the Labour, what we have are two bourgeois factions fighting over a knackered party, and I think most of the public are just completely bored with this. Right, let's listen to the MPs who have left their party. The values which I hold really dear and which led me to join the Labour Party as a student almost 20 years ago remain who I am. And yet these values have been consistently and constantly violated, undermined and attacked. The past three years have confirmed how irresponsible it would be to allow this leader of the opposition to take the office of Prime Minister of the United Kingdom. Many people uh, still in the Labour Party will privately admit this to be true. Most people are like my family. They do not want to be patronised by left-wing intellectuals who think that being poor and working class constitutes a state of grace. The current leadership have been very successful at changing this party beyond recognition and in doing so is failing the people who have supported the Labour Party all their lives. I am sickened that the Labour Party is now a racist, anti-Semitic party. I'm furious that the Labour leadership is complicit in facilitating Brexit. It is time we dumped this country's old-fashioned politics and created an alternative that does justice to who we are today. Chukka ending there. Angela, tell us about your decision. It's been a, a very difficult decision to make. It's been some time in the, uh, in, it's taken a long time to develop it and to get to where we are now. But we are confident, really confident that we've done the right thing because we feel that morally and politically it's incumbent on us to break free of a party that no longer represents what we stand for. We don't, the culture of the Labour Party is vicious. It's bullying, it's unpleasant. 
we feel that if Jeremy Corbyn were to become Prime Minister, then we would be compromised in terms of national security, in terms of um, maintaining a mixed economy which can develop prosper prosperity for all. And fundamentally, more than anything else, look, I said this in, this morning in the press conference, I really believe that most people in our country that want to get on in life and they want a political system which does not get in the way but rather supports them to get on in life. I really, really passionately believe that and I find the current Labour Party very patronising in this respect. But Labour has been your political home yes, all your has. life. It's all been your life. family's political Absolutely. home. Yes. To make a decision like this for you personally, how momentous was it? Oh, it has been enormous. I mean, look, we've had ups and downs. I won't deny that, <laughs> you know, in terms of how we feel about it. And my, part, my family has been voting Labour since the party was formed in 1906. We, we've always voted Labour. But my own family now feels more sceptical than they ever have before. Uh, my close family feels very sceptical about the current Labour Party, no longer has confidence in its ability to, to, to deliver the future that they're looking for. So one has to be brave about this and move on. And if the party, and I, I don't believe in institutions, I believe in values, and I'm afraid I've had to take the very difficult decision to move on because I really genuinely believe that the country deserves something better. But why not stay within and fight? because we can't fight. We've tried that. We've tried it for the last four years. It's not working. Not only has Jeremy Corbyn got hold of the machinery of the party, he's changed the locks. We no longer have the keys to the party. It's over. The Labour Party cannot be rescued for sensible middle ground politics. It's over. Right. I mean, what's the next step then? If mm. you say it's not about institutions and therefore not about parties, it's about values, what's the next step? Are there more yeah. MPs going to join your independent group? Well, we hope so. I mean, look, we're, we're, we're willing to talk to any colleagues and the point is that a political party is not an end in itself. It's a means to an end. And we're saying to our colleagues, if you feel as unhappy as we do, come and talk to us. But more <coughs> important, just as important as that, this is not about Westminster. This is about saying to the country, we know that large numbers of our voters, uh, voters out there feel politically homeless. We know they're unhappy with the current state of politics. Politics is broken. And we're saying to the people out there, come and talk to us. Tell us what you think and help us build the movement. We can't do it on our own. We need the British people to do it with us. Right, so this is a movement, not an alternative Absolutely. party. Well, it's a movement we'd like it to be a party one day, but we need to develop it organically. All right, let's bring in John Healy. He is the Shadow Housing Secretary. Um, obviously, you have listened to the seven MPs this morning. You may have just heard Angela underlining her reasons for leaving the party. What do you say to Angela, listening to her? It's the biggest decision of her life politically um, and how saddened she is to leave. Huge decision. I've known Angela a long time. I've worked very closely with her and I know how hard it's been for uh, all seven of these MPs this morning. Um, and I'm desperately disappointed, but I think they're wrong. Um, if they want to see uh, this country avoid a hard deal, no deal Brexit, if they want to see a big change in how this country is governed, if they want to help uh, root out anti-Semitism in the country and in the Labour Party, they should stay. Stay, uh, be a part of the solution, argue your case and help win the <coughs> Labour government in the future that so many millions of people need and want. Do you recognise Angela's description of the party and the leadership as abusive, a racist culture, an anti-Semitic culture, hijacked by the machine of the hard left? They've changed the locks and the party cannot be rescued. No, I don't. I mean, people like me who've, who, who served proudly under a Labour government, under Tony Blair and Gordon Brown, are in there fighting part of the Labour leadership. And I don't think that description would be recognised by the thousands of Labour members and most MPs. <coughs> it's certainly true we've let our Jewish members, our Jewish MPs and the Jewish people down and we need to stamp out uh, that sort of anti-Semitism. But this... Um, overblown description to help justify this this morning's mistaken move I think misses the mark well <clears throat> can I just say look John one thing I just want to make clear from the beginning you and I have known each other for a very long time and I'm really pleased to see that from from your demeanor here that we will not fall out personally there will you're being courteous to me now and there are large 
a large number of my colleagues in the Parliamentary Labour Party that will do exactly that. We'll, we'll stay friends, we'll work together as and when we can on things. Um, but I don't recognise your description of the party. And I think to say that our description of where it is now on racism and anti-Semitism is overblown, I think, misses the mark. Um, I think it's also true to say that it's our experience over the past four years that there is no chance whatsoever of pulling any of this back. And I think we have to agree to disagree. I do not think that the Labour Party under Jeremy Corbyn's leadership can build the kind of life-changing, better future that all our people out there are looking for. You mentioned Labour MPs and members. The people I'm vote bothered about are Labour voters as much as anything else. And I know from my post bag and from the emails I get that Labour voters out there are really unhappy at the state of politics now. Well, and they see the Labour Party as part of the problem. I mean, we stood together on the Labour manifesto yeah. 18 months ago that would have made a big change in this country for the better. But you and I represent constituencies in South Very Yorkshire. Mm. And you talk to the old miners or the steel workers in South <coughs> Yorkshire, they remember mm. the early 1980s, the last time there was some sort of split in the Labour Party. Mm. They know what happened then. It led to a decade of Thatcherite, Tory damage to our communities and our area. And the problem for me and why I believe this is the wrong way to pursue the labour aims mm. that you all seven of you still have is that it takes the pressure and the attention off Theresa May and the Conservatives. It's a very critical time when we have to be working together to press her to stop a mm. no deal Brexit and if we have a general election which we may well do in the coming months this can only mean more Tory MPs. I don't think the scrutiny John stands up to comparison, the, the, uh, in the early 80s, you had a very strong Tory party and there was an alternative to a split left. Where we are now is completely different, different century, different challenges. And we are facing the biggest challenges as a country um, that we have seen, as I said in, earlier on this morning, in the post-war period. Every single major political party is letting the people of this country down and confidence in the major political parties is at an all-time low. And on that basis, I do not believe that the action we've taken today represents potentially the return of a, a series of strong Labour Tory governments. This government is one of the worst Tory governments I've ever seen. It really is. People out there are, are absolutely looking for politics to be repaired, rebuilt, and to represent once again the sensible middle ground of politics. But your, constituents, your constituents voted Labour. Yeah. I mean, is there a sense of betrayal to those people in your constituency yeah. who voted for you on a Labour ticket? Yeah. Well, I mean, <clears throat> you'll have to go out and ask them, but I, I well, know from the 27, 2017, out. in the election in 2017, we spoke to 11,000 voters, and we know from that work that we did, that there was a significant degree of unhappiness with the Corbyn leadership. And I, I actually made it clear to my voters, I didn't believe in, um, in abandoning the nuclear deterrent. I believed in strong national security, membership of NATO, and my voters res absolutely warmed to that message. So I think that my voters will expect me to carry on representing the values Don, that I should represent. you do what Ash has just said and actually test that in a by-election? Well, none of us. Um, Angela Smith wasn't elected as Angela Smith in 2017. I wasn't elected as John Healy. I was only elected because I was John Healy, the Labour candidate. And our areas voted for a Labour MP to be part of the Labour effort mm -hmm. to try and secure a Labour government. And why I deeply regret mm -hmm. what you've done today and mm -hmm. why I feel it's so deeply damaging is we're less than six weeks from this Brexit date with the country still poised potentially to crash out with no arrangements in place. And this is a distraction mm -hmm. and it's a diversion. I, I, I really don't think that the uh... Um, press conference this morning and the decision that we've taken today will make is not the distraction that you're talking about John and I think you know we will continue in Parliament in the coming weeks to do our best to avoid a no-deal Brexit you know very well that all seven of us have been at the forefront of the fight to avoid a no-deal Brexit and to make sure 
that we get the right deal for the people that will not make the country poorer. I, you know, and I on the point, and, uh, you and other Labour MPs uh, you I, need to be fighting also for a Labour government. John, and John, this on Brexit, divided, will, dysfunctional, distracted yeah. Tory government on, that is letting down the country. I, that is that's not, why. No, that's no, why no. this is so important. We, we we do not believe any longer that the Labour Party represents our values in any depth at all. So our view is that the Tory party, the Labour party and the Lib Dems, none of them are yeah. representing the British all right, people I'm adequately. Have, I'm going to have to let John go, but should she, she being Angela Smith, excuse me, um, actually contest a by-election? Well, I think if, 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 if Angela and the other six have the courage of the convictions they laid out today, they should, they should put that to their own constituents. I, they were elected, each and every one of them, as Labour MPs first as Angela Smith second, or Chukra Amuna yeah. second, or as Chris Leslie second. It's the same for me, it's the same for any of us, I dare say, even with Daniel Hammond <laughs> in, uh, in the Tory party in the Euro elections. As, as All right, well. we're, go we're going to let you go. On that, why not test that? Because I know in 2017, I know from the conversations we had with voters and the letters that I had to put out in the, um, to Labour voters who would not vote Labour unless I reassured them that Jeremy Corbyn wouldn't be Prime Minister, <laughs> I know we would have lost that seat. We only kept my seat in 2017 because I reassured <coughs> Labour voters that Jeremy Corbyn would not win the election and therefore they could, in safety, return me as their MP. Ash? I'm, I'm sorry, that's completely outrageous. You stood on a Labour manifesto and on that Labour manifesto it said that you would deliver the referendum result and now you're turning around and saying you don't want that. What's changed since then? You said, stood on a Labour manifesto which would, had it won, made Jeremy Corbyn Prime Minister, and now you're saying that you had separate conversations with your constituents. Yes, I did. Why should anybody trust a single word coming out of your mouth when you're saying that your behaviour in 2017 was dishonest? Because I was honest with my voters. That election was a your very... Your constituents voted oh, for a I, Labour I MP. I, I didn't interrupt. Yeah. My, I was very honest with my voters. I had, uh, I've known, I've had a relationship with my constituency for a very long time now. I know how most of my voters think because they correspond with me all the time. I was very honest with them. That election was called at very short notice. Nobody expected it. And I was clear that I did not stand for nuclear, unilateral nuclear disarmament. Which wasn't in the manifesto. Removing membership of NATO. Which wasn't in the manifesto. And on Brexit, but we know what Jeremy Corbyn really thinks but about this. But it's not in the things. manifesto. And on Brexit, I was clear with my voters that I would not vote for a Brexit that made the country poorer. Let and now we see Jeremy Corbyn facilitating a Tory Brexit. Right, let me just ask you, Ash, because one of the things that Angela said is that her values haven't changed, but the party's values have. Is there a sense... You, you're not a member of the Labour Party. No. You've said you're literally a communist. Can you understand why people in the Labour Party who've been there as long as Angela would have a problem with that? And that the party's changed, not them? You know, absolutely. And I think that the change isn't actually so much to do with the personalities around the Labour Party. It's about the political landscape that a Labour Party would have to inherit. I think that ever since 2008, we've seen that this model of sort of soft centre-left, centre-right beige politics, it's been completely discredited all over Europe. So any party that wants to do well in this country dealing with the state of people's household finances will have to offer something different. What I don't <coughs> understand, and I think this is also why they're not so keen to launch a party straight away, is because the policies that they would have to offer run against the current of public opinion. Brendan? Uh, well, you know, the Labour Party historically exists precisely to thwart communism. So if you were a genuine radical, I don't know why on earth you'd spend so much time hanging around the Labour Party. It's completely perverse. But drinks. what we... Drinks, fine, that's great. But don't call yourself a communist in that case. But the thing, what we see here in this clash is just how completely phony this debate in the Labour Party is. Because I'm really sick and tired of people saying that this split is over Brexit. Because in truth, what it is over is what is the most effective way of killing Brexit? What is the most effective way of stabbing working class Labour voters in the back? That's really what's going on between the Corbynites on one side and the Blairites or whatever we call them on the other side. Although they've said it's broader than that. No, but, uh, but, no, but if, you look at, if you look at the Corbynistas uh, on one side, they want a permanent customs union, they want to be aligned with the single market, that's a betrayal of Brexit. If you look at these splitters on the other side, they want to prevent Brexit entirely. This is not a principle split over Brexit. This is a, 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 a cynical split over what's the best way to sell out working class Labour voters. Angela? That's, I just don't accept that at all. Look, 
My constituency now supports, for instance, a second referendum, a final say, by a margin of 60% to 40%. There is a significant majority now in my constituency which voted Leave for a second referendum. The second point is that none of my constituents voted to be poorer and I have a responsibility as a Member of Parliament to make sure that that doesn't happen. So th this is not about betraying Brexit or anything like that. Of it, is it is also much broader than Brexit. It's absolutely Nothing about is broader future, than Brexit right now. The, the, no, sorry, the future of the economy, which I accept Brexit is, is, is part of. It's also about national security and it's about, look, the decent everyday values of the British people. I'm it's sorry, not no, actually, I'm sorry. I, I, I think it's you a know. bit much to say we can't have a by-election because we've had too many elections, but we must have a second referendum. It's, you know, well, we, yeah. we can't, that, that really is case. Do you think, do you think I, a Victorian peace I, might affect? Uh, no, I don't think so. I do actually, though, have a lot of sympathy with, with Angela's general point, which is at any point since 1906, she would have been completely in the mainstream. Mm. And we've been very lucky. I don't think you have to be on the left in this country to see that the left of centre party here has been a lot less bloody and aggressive and belligerent than some of the revolutionary parties not far away. The Labour was a party that was about building people up. It actually, just Brendan said, it was, it was anti-communist. It, it came out of brass bands and the temperance movement and the nonconformist churches. Yes. And that part my party is did. now right, and my that party is did. now being led yeah. by somebody no, who regrets the outcome of the Cold War. Right. So of course no. it was going to cause. A but hang on, the, the result of the last election was that Jeremy Corbyn got forty percent of the vote yeah. share, which was yeah. higher but, than for decades we've seen, and he deprived Theresa May uh, of a majority. And, 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 and we're pretty confident that that partly it was about the collapse of the third parties as we know, and it was partly because I think Theresa May's power grab, which is how it felt at the time, give me more power, give me more seats so I can do as I want, was rejected by the British people. And but I this doesn't say, add up. This doesn't no, no, add up. No, no, I'm sorry, can I just finish? The point is I think the British people wanted the Tories to stay in power, unfortunately, because they were very sceptical and did not trust Jeremy Corbyn to be Prime Minister, but they equally did not want Theresa May to have a large majority. But the, the, and I have to say, look, the whole the 2017 election for me demonstrated that politics really is genuinely broken. Is and it broken? we need to get back to sensible mainstream politics. It is broken, but the key divide is yeah. not between Angela and Jeremy Corbyn or between these splitters and the other people. The key divide is between, between ordinary people and the political elite. That's where the great divide now exists. But I just think Dan is wrong, actually, about Corbyn. Corbyn is incredibly moderate. Corbyn is more moderate than Michael Foote was. Cor Corbyn is arguably very similar to Ed Miliband. A quarrel that this so country I think, has been no, in where it hasn't on. been on the can, other can side. I, one more thing. Can, can I finish the IRA. and I'll come back? One more Soviet very quick Union, thing. Chavez, he has <laughs> never, I'll let ever... I'll come back in a second. One of these setting the bar too high to us that the Prime Minister should be on our side, right? If you look at like nationalisation and so on, Corbyn is more moderate than other Labour MPs have been. But I just want to say one more thing. If you stay in the Labour Party, while a Labour government is um, executing imperialistic wars overseas, but then you leave because you don't like Jeremy Corbyn's attitude and policies. That suggests your moral I, compass is broken, no, I'm Angela. Sorry, no, I'm really sorry. The very fact that last year, when we, we, we all saw what happened in Salisbury with the Skripal poisonings, and we What's saw Jeremy Corbyn and his front bench, his front bench cast doubt on the clear evidence from our own security and intelligence services that the Russian state was behind that. When we see Jeremy Corbyn defending the Venezuelan Chavez Maduro regime, I'm sorry, enough is enough. When we see anti-Semitism in the Labour Party, enough is enough. When we see the Labour Party patronising working class people and suggesting that perhaps being poor and working class is something to be very proud of, rather than helping working class people do better in life, that's enough. It's me. pretty damning, isn't it, when you listen to Angela listing it and MPs saying the party's racist, it's anti-Semitic, it's unfit for government, it's a risk to security. Well, you know something, the person who um, is part of the splinter who I will really miss and I think was a really positive force in the Labour Party is Luciana Berger. We've got hugely Berger. different politics on lots of things, in particular um, approaches to Brexit, we differ a bit on IHRA, but she's a deeply principled politician who's done amazing work on mental health and I applaud her work on anti-Semitism every step of the way and I think there's a lot that has to be done within the party and like you're not going to hear me say anything other than that. However, when it comes to what are the issues that people are going to be voting on, not being Jeremy Corbyn, unfortunately, 
is not a manifesto in itself. People are going to be looking at things like your record on water privatization. You're like one of the last people left in this country who still believes in it. They will look at the fact that you're on the all party water group, which is mostly paid for by the <laughs> water industry. And they'll go, you know what? That it stinks of corruption. Can I just well, it is say, right, just thank you, because I must ask Dan. Uh, go on. Anna. Most British people would not want to vote for a party that is racist and anti Semitic. Despite all the other values, they will not vote for a and party that's anti Semitic. I think there is much more work to be done on that front, and okay. that's why but, I do generally think that. Well, I do think, think that, that some Luciana on the Berger hard left have could have stayed. done a lot more already to combat anti-Semitism in the Labour Party, but they haven't. Right, let's talk again about uh, Conservative MPs who might be attracted by an independent grouping, particularly if part of the, the mandate, if you like, is seeking a second referendum. Why are you so sure that nobody will join? I mean, I may look a complete idiot by the time this programme is aired tomorrow, but I haven't detected any enthusiasm uh, from it. And I, I think the reason for that is that there is much more uh, of a sense of coherence within the Conservative Party ideology than uh, there On is Brexit. within Labour. Well, the, the Labour Party is now, as I say, it's being led by somebody who basically, when he was asked, if, if, would you have ever been on our side, the, the earliest example he could come back with was the, the Second World War, you know, yeah, after presumably after Barbarossa rather than before it. I mean, th th there is a huge difference between Labour as it has existed and Labour as represented by Corbyn. There is not any equivalent rift with... Well, it, well except, Carol, let's have a look at the Daily Telegraph. Two more Tory MPs targeted for deselection by Eurosceptics. Isn't that going to be the very thing that could drive people away from the Conservative Party? no hesitation in saying you should not deselect somebody because of a difference of opinion on the EU. Yeah, but if it's you want to deselect them because you think they're, they're uh, lazy or whatever, that's a different issue. Of course, the, the, the local parties should have the power to deselect people if they, if they mm. have person. Mm. But, but we should never, and I don't think we will, become a party where you are driven out because you have a difference of opinion on one issue. And that is a big difference between our party and Labour. You look at the, the, the response you've had mm. to Angela today from all well, these people saying, you know, F uh, off then. It's, uh, well, what about the accusations from Tory MPs about a party within a party? That's what they accuse the Eurosceptics mm. within the Conservative purple Party. Purple momentum. The, uh, the purple momentum from Anna Subri, another Conservative MP. Are you saying that there is no big rift pretty equal to what's going on in the Labour Party? Oh. We were all just talking about who was elected on what manifesto. All of the Conservative MPs were elected on a manifesto, like the Labour MPs that promised to honour the 2016 referendum result. Uh, and no, I don't see a... a I, I think characterising the people who say, yes, let's do that as a party within a party is bizarre, because they're the people who are pushing for uh, implementation of the manifesto. I mean, I, I, I appreciate... Daniel's points about um, the grounds for deselection, and I agree with that. I think tolerance and respect and diversity is really important to the health of a political party, but it's not what I'm hearing from Tory colleagues at Westminster. What are you hearing? What I'm hearing is there's a huge degree of unhappiness within the Tory party, serious divisions between um, colleagues, but also between colleagues and their parties, and we are picking this up as a major issue within And might Westminster. they join your grouping? Who knows? I mean, we have to, we're waiting for colleagues to come and talk to us. Are you working with the Liberal Democrats in terms of trying to put forward some sort of... Really funny that that question only comes up now, right? Spare a thought for, for poor Vince Cable today, the absolute ultimate spare wheel in British politics. <laughs> only now is it worth asking whether anyone's thinking of joining the Lib Dems. Um, <laughs> it may not be worth asking, maybe worth well, asking before, but... Uh, yes. Yeah, yes, Joe. Look, Joe, the, uh, our view, and I, I keep saying this, is that all the major political parties are unfit for power. Our view is that if Lib Dem colleagues want to come and talk to us, just in just the same way as Labour colleagues and Tory colleagues want to come to talk to us, we're very, very willing to sit and talk to them. But there's no merger, no, no sense of a merger between us and the Lib Dems. Who would you prefer to win the next happen. election? At the moment, none of the political parties. Angela right, Smith, but somebody, shock somebody, somebody is going to have to Absolutely. form a government. Who would you Absolutely. prefer Which it to be? Would it be Theresa May? Would it be no. Jeremy Corbyn? Uh, would no. it be Vince we Cable? We don't think any of the parties are fit for power. That's why we've done what we've done to build a, an alternative political movement and hopefully in the long term a, a, a new politics and a new political party. Do you, accept, do you accept the political system at the moment is coming away at the seams? Yes. Absolutely. That's one of the great benefits of Brexit, I think, because it's exposed how utterly aloof and disconnected and uncaring in many instances the political class is in relation to most normal people. And if you look at all the op opinion polls over the past six to nine months, they all show that people don't really know who should be prime minister. Their, their favourite choice is not sure. Not sure is the person None who should run above. this country. None of the above. Um, they, uh, they, they think that politicians do not represent their interests. They think the political parties don't listen to them. That's the culture we live in. And I simply don't think it will be helped. I think the driver of it, I should say, 
is the way the political class is treating the largest democratic vote in British history. And that is not, that's across I, the board. That's been done by the Tories, I, by the Corbynites right. and by this new party. We're going to come back to this um, at the end of the programme, but we're going to move on for now. On tomorrow's show, we're going to be talking about transparency and what duty, if any, think tanks have to be open about their funding if they want to take part in public life. Have a look at this. And you can keep asking me, and I'm just not going to tell you. It's a private matter. And just the fact that there are loads of people screaming on Twitter asking me a question is not a reason why you should answer it. Supposing I were to say, these are the 12 FTSE 100 companies that give us money. You actually think these conspiracy theorists should go away? Maybe they wouldn't they go away, are. but you'd be being honest, they, they, wouldn't they, you? They, well, but as I say, it's not a question of honesty. It's a question of privacy. That's think tanks, that's tomorrow. But Brendan and Ash, you work mm. for online publications. They are having an increasingly higher profile. Do you think it is important to be as transparent as possible uh, to who's funding you? I think that's really down to the publications and the think tanks themselves. But the thing is, uh, Spiked, for example, Spiked magazine is funded primarily by its readers. We have a charitable arm in the in America called Spiked US, which, to the great titillation of the conspiratorial chattering classes in Britain, has received funding from the Freedom and Tolerance Program of the Charles Koch Foundation, which has also funded the American Civil Liberties Union, the National Council Against Censorship, Harvard University, and so on. So, the, but the thing I dislike about this argument is it's based Why? on bad faith. It's based on this idea that you can't possibly believe what you're saying. You must be uh, the puppet of some extraordinary, uh, powerful, uh, rich person. And, and, it, and but that's you've got nothing very... to hide. No, of course. I, I think if people want to tell you who their funders are, they should. If they don't want to, that's fine. But I think we should trust that people mean what they say. Because the damaging impact of this bad faith is that it does give rise to a conspiratorial, a conspiracy theory view of politics, where we're always talking about dark money or dirty money or Jewish money in the case of the American Congresswoman and her recent um, anti-Semitic outburst. This sense that we, we have to know the funders in order to know the truth, it's damaging democratic is, discussion. Is it damaging or is it just people being transparent? What about Navarra Media? So nearly 100% of all our donations just come from our viewers. We had a little bit of funding from an organisation I think called Amiel in Melbourne a couple of years ago. You haven't submitted a financial statement, have you, Navarra Media, which is why it's been difficult to work out who has been funding yeah, you. Yeah, and this is simply because we only now have a paid operations role. Everything that we were doing really up until this year was volunteer run, where people mm. that don't have any experience in growing an organization we were learning on the job there have been mistakes there have been errors and we're working really hard to rectify them now because now we have a full-time operations person and it's amazing transparency versus privacy i think transparency is really important because obviously who's paying you changes what it is you're saying and you know ilhan omar got a lot of stick for her comments on the role of money in American politics in relation to Israel, but there's also Saudi money. There's also fossil fuel money. And this changes what is considered by possible by, by our politicians. All right, we're going to I talk. Don't think I just don't think that's true. Mm. The only way yeah. that people could persuade the IEA to accept money was by pretending to agree with the IEA. So that's the opposite of a scandal. Mm. That's the opposite of corruption. If someone had given them money and they changed their view, that would have been a scandal, but no one has ever tried to suggest And that. we're going to discuss this more tomorrow um, on that point. Thank you, Dan. I'm going to welcome in Robin D'Angelo. She's a sociologist, uh, American sociologist and author, whose book is here. It's called White uh, Fragility. Um, Robin, explain what is white fragility? Well, social life is patterned and predictable in observable and describable ways, and racial inequality is a very consistent pattern, and so is uh, the overall white response to it, or to when that issue is race. So what I'm doing is describing one particular common white pattern and offering an explanation not only for how we come to have that pattern but also how it functions. So the pattern is the defensiveness uh, at any suggestion that racial inequality exists and that each of us is a part of it. So the term fragility is meant to capture how little it takes to set us off. For many white people the mere suggestion that being white has meaning will cause great umbrage, generalizing about white people People will cause great upset and umbrage, but the impact of that umbrage is not fragile at all. It functions as a very powerful way to repel the challenge and to protect the racial hierarchy. In your research, and I read the first few chapters of White Fragility, not all of it, do you think most white people are racist without realizing it? 
Yes, I don't think it's possible to avoid absorbing uh, racist worldview <laughs> and racist biases because they are circulating 24-7 in the culture. They're in the language, they're in the institutions, they're in the media and the film. Uh, they're in the overwhelmingly white teaching force and curriculum and the, the centering of a white worldview, but positioning it as a universal human worldview. Ash? So we often see these things as being very adversarial. So you bring up the issue of racism or anti-racism, and then suddenly you've got two sides at each other's throats. Mm -hmm. Now, half of my family is white. My stepdad, the only dad I've ever known, is, well, he's actually more of a pinkish color, and both <laughs> my brothers are white, my niece and nephew, and I love them dearly. And a huge part of having a relationship with my brothers, with my stepdad, has been navigating the fact that our experiences, because I'm South Asian and they're not, are wildly different. Sometimes that has involved conflict, that's involved upset, but because fundamentally we love each other, we want to understand each other better. And also on the part of my stepdad, he wants to be able to protect me from the world because, you know, he's a dad. He will amend his position and reflect on the ways in which his position as a white man has you know, attached blinkers to him throughout <coughs> his life. Uh, uh, do you feel like that if you're asked a question about race? Um, maybe I'm a fragile white man, but what I dislike about these arguments is, is, is the rehabilitation of racial thinking and the rehabilitation of racial determinism and the idea that white people are inev inevitably racist as if, it's, as if they were born with some original sin mm. mirrors the, what used to be said about black people, which is that they were biologically determined, that they were biologically inferior. And it's, I think it's actually quite repulsive. But the, the, one of the key problems, the but one of the oh, key yeah, problems, no, but you just said that we're influenced by the culture and that's a replacement of biology. But one of the key problems I have with this. This idea that all white people have the shared experiences, it seems to me to be such an extreme denial of the divisions that exist within white communities on the basis of class, on the basis of power. You know, my white family, for example, my white parents, for example, are immigrants. They ex experienced extreme poverty. They experienced a lot of hardship. The idea that they have the same experience and the same reaction to things as the incredibly wealthy people who might have given them jobs at some point in their life <laughs> is a complete denial of all right, well, class let Robert, reality. Let, let Robin respond to that. So, so first, I was born into poverty. I have been poor most of my life. Homelessness, foster care, didn't go to college till later. I always knew that I was white, right? That is a huge barrier that I have not faced, and not facing it has actually helped me navigate classism. I don't know how anyone can say that the experience of being poor or working class and white is the same as being poor and working class and black. Right. Well, let's put let's put that to, let's put that to Dan. I mean, is there a sense if you're white, you're just always going to have that advantage, whatever else is going on? In no, I mean, I, I agree with Brendan. I think it's really yeah, sad that, that we are now becoming yeah. so obsessed with people's physiognomy, mm. that that becomes their defining characteristic, yeah. that we judge them not by their kindness, their intelligence, their generosity, their courage, but purely by how they look. We, we say that person A is responsible for person B, who he or she may never have met because they happen to look the same. This is the opposite, for me, of the anti-racist ideal that mm. in the 20th century, liberals and progressives all adhered to. We took the view, and that, 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 in fact, liberals and conservatives alike took the view we should all be primarily individuals. The left fought bravely and honorably for the right of minorities to be treated the same. It is very sad to see them now demanding their right to be treated differently. Right. I mean, you talk about over-smiling, um, which I didn't quite understand what you were trying to get at, that the kindness, niceness, these are not things that people yeah. should use. No, I'm not saying that they shouldn't. I mean, being nice is certainly better than not being nice, but that it doesn't interrupt the systemic nature of racism. The research is really clear that children born in Western contexts internalize a sense of knowing it is better to be white by three to four. No child grows up and doesn't know very early mm -hmm. that it's better in this society to be white. Uh, and they, uh, you know, it, everyone has implicit bias. I think this is another key piece. As long as you define racism or to be racist as to have conscious and intentional uh, malintent towards somebody based on race, you're going to be defensive and you're going to be offended That's by the suggestion that you're complicit with it. I, I recognize entirely the, the argument being made and it, this is a really incredibly important debate and we need to work through it rather than running away from it. I understand that. And I, I, I would add to the, to the argument made to say that uh, a white working class woman finds hard, life hard enough. A BME working class woman, and this is the gender aspect, mm -hmm. will find it even harder. But 
it's not just about colour. I mean, you know, the recent history of the party I've just left suggests that it's not just about being black or a funny, you know, different BM, from the BME community, but the, the Jewish community equally, the Jewish community equally suffers the same kind of cultural alienation. I'm not but saying so it's I, the only form of oppression, yeah, it's yeah, a very yeah. profound there's this form constant, that we have to grapple with. But this yeah. identity politics has given rise to this constant fragmentation. So you now you can't even say we're working class. You have to say, well, I'm black and working class, or I'm a female and working class, or I'm trans and working class. It really proves that intersectionality is actually the enemy of solidarity because it splits groups more and more and more so that the possibility of coming together and saying, look, we have common interests and we should fight for those common interests just goes down and down all every the time. Every individual I matters. I, I, every individual matters. And that's where we need to get to culturally. It's but I accept actually. the barriers and the cultural left. barriers. It's, I mean, do you want to know an interesting thing about how my mum and stepdad first met? This is like way back in the 80s and I think she was wearing flares at the time. It was actually part of being the labour move, uh, being part of the labour movement. She was an anti-racist activist. Uh, he was um, doing lots of work on industrial relations, and it was that kind of space which didn't erase her difference and her specific experience as a woman of colour, where they could first meet, first develop a friendship, first develop a relationship. I don't mm -hmm. see why the observation of me having a different lived experience suddenly means that we can't understand each other better. Yeah, I totally and I'm going to have to that. stop it there. I'm sorry because we're almost out of time. Totally I'm going to have to let Robin that. go and her book, uh, White Fragility. Um, we're going to welcome Laura Kunzberg, our political editor, in, in just a moment. We're going to hear from the Shadow Chancellor, John McDonnell, in response to Angela and her colleagues having left the Labour Party. As I say, it is better to remain within the party, fight your corner, sometimes you'll win, sometimes you'll lose. But when you splinter off in this way, you lose, well, you lose your voice in the party. And if you do splinter off and you're going into another, on another political platform, I think you have a responsibility to go back to the electorate then and in by-elections fight on that platform. And if you're no longer a Labour Party MP, you're elected as a Labour MP, you should go back to the people. Laura, bring us up to date. We just heard John McDonnell there talking about his view of them staying and fighting from within. Well, they're not going to. How big a blow is this? I think in terms of right now, this moment, it's not surprising because this has been boiling up for a very, very long time, indeed since before the general election. I mean, we know there was a large chunk of Labour MPs inside the parliamentary party who felt that Jeremy Corbyn's election was just not the direction that they wanted to see the party going in the first place. However, they stayed to try to make it work, but there has been that building sense of unhappiness. And, you know, I, I know that there are many of them who said during the 17 election that they told their constituents that they didn't think that Jeremy Corbyn would end up being the Prime Minister. So therefore, that's what Angela said. stay. And, and it was, that's the first time I've heard a Labour MP, a former Labour MP, say that openly. She's not the only one to have believed that. Now, in terms of where this goes next, Boring frankly, piece. right now, it is impossible to say, look, I'm not going to be surprised if in the coming days there are a relatively small number who make a similar decision. There may be a couple of Conservative MPs who in the coming weeks make a similar decision. But I think at this point, look, this could be just this sort of small explosion of unhappiness that had been there for a long time. Or it could be, Joe, and frankly, this will be up to also our audience and members of the public. Oh, yeah. This might be Absolutely. the beginning of a, of a bigger realignment of, of British politics, yeah, which yeah. Brexit has been maybe not the root, but the catalyst of. Right, we well, don't know I mean, Angela right. and Brendan think it, it, it will be. Dan, I presume you don't see this as the start of a realignment generally. <laughs> like everybody else, right, if I'm being honest, I haven't got the foggiest. But it, it, <laughs> from, from where I'm standing, it doesn't seem likely. I think what we're seeing is a, a an almost inevitable consequence of the fact that traditional Labour voters, the kind that Angela was talking about, Labour MPs and the Labour leadership are, op, are occupying three barely intersecting circles that only just touch at the edges. I think a split was was coming sooner or later, but I don't think that that has consequences for the other parties. Any changes that we're going to see from Labour leadership in response I to this? I don't think imminently. I mean, look, we'll have to see what this does to the alchemy around the Brexit votes. So the seven that have left are all people who have been pushing for another referendum, and they are therefore not people who are going to vote for this deal in any case. So it may not make an immediate difference to the arithmetic. Whether the alchemy around it changes, because we're in such unpredictable times, you know, we just don't know at this stage. But one thing that just was very striking to me this morning, being in that room, listening to them all speak, none of them took any joy in this. And I think they're very well aware that they are in for a very bruising time. On that, that's all we have time for. Thank you. Bye bye.